In March 2018, we opened our doors to the public with a vision not just to create challenging professional theatre, but to use this as a platform to inspire and bring communities together. Theatre and culture build identity. With theatre and culture in our local life, the community landscape is more vibrant. Local life is enriched. We believe that the benefits of theatre should be available for everyone. Our Theatre for All programme has removed financial barriers, giving disadvantaged people access to the theatre free of charge. So we were told that we'd come here and have a Christmas meal and then go and watch A Christmas Carol. Our aim is to make live professional theatre available to everyone and use that experience for positive change. Theatre can be transformational in young lives. Our academy is now in its fourth year and we continue to build on our vision of bringing the best performing arts tuition to the heart of the Cotswolds. We work hard to make our academy as inclusive and as accessible as possible. Discounts apply for parents with more than one child. Our bursaries help support talented children from less affluent backgrounds. The academy creates a fun and challenging environment where children can build friendships and develop key skills not just for theatre, but for life. We are also able to provide real opportunities for students who wish to pursue careers in the arts. My name is Harry Apps. I am currently playing Marius in Les Miserables in the West End. Barn outreach and learning programmes engage with thousands of people. Our free workshops support the drama curriculum in local schools. Singing and musical theatre workshops in community groups and care homes have helped address issues of isolation. Our Song for Sirencester project in aid of mental health charities brought our community together in an unprecedented way. We've collaborated with many charities in the region, including the Churn Project, to support individuals dealing with the barriers to finding work. Since working you and my life's changed. It's given me some purpose, given me an interest, some confidence I was lacking prior to all this. The Barn Theatre played a pivotal role in the town's 2018 World War I centenary celebrations. Who could forget our record-breaking human poppy? Our live streaming work on the annual Advent Festival helped thousands engage and take part in Sirencester's Christmas festivities. In these times of uncertainty, we strive to keep the community together. The theatre may be temporarily closed, but our commitment to you goes on. Even now, our amazing costume department are helping the NHS by making scrubs for frontline workers. We've used our technology to build a free live streaming service that provides much needed community news and entertainment for all the family. Broadcasting every day to keep us all connected. We are not just a theatre. We are the bar. Welcome to the Circus Hey guys, it's the end of the week. How's it been for you? Hey, cool conversations last night. Who enjoyed that? Wasn't Sean fantastic? I think it's one of the best uh, we've done so far. I would love to hear, hear your thoughts 
on it. I mean, hit Sean up or hit myself up on social media. Let us know what you thought of it. I, I was blown away by his five top tips for endurance challenges. I'll be employing some of that myself this weekend. So if you didn't see it, don't spare. Uh, I'll put the link in here. You can also get it as a podcast these days if you don't want to see my ugly mug uh, on the screen the whole time. But remember, it is the weekend coming up. I hope you have loads of fun. We're in it together and we'll get it done eventually together. Have a fab one, guys. Oh my goodness, that was a hard, strenuous run this morning. Didn't like that at all. But the good news is, it's done. Let's not forget that tagline these days, get it done. And uh, hey, cool conversations this week. We have a fabulous guest. I wonder if you can guess who it's going to be. This is a guy that I've known for nearly 25 years. He's probably spent more time on uh, Arctic and Antarctic ice than any other Brit. He's got a fantastic eye for an image, an award-winning photographer. He's got, he's got the resilience of a bull. He fought back from a life-threatening illness to get back to full fitness. And he's somebody that I feel very proud and privileged to know. And I wonder if you guys can guess who it is. He's a star, I tell you that much. Fantastic, short, sharp run this morning. Great way to uh, to start Sunday. Got a uh, got a family workout now, but this is quite amusing. I don't know if you can see him. He's over there somewhere. There's a dog hiding in the... Oh, there you are, just see him, see him? He thinks he's hiding. You can just see his tail if you look very carefully. He's up there somewhere. And he's not coming out. He's playing hide and seek. There he is. Oh, he's gone again. He thinks I can't see him. He's hilarious. That's Otis the dog, my running companion. He's loving it this morning as well. Anyway, guys, you have a fabulous rest of the weekend. And no doubt, we'll catch up at some stage in the week. It's a hell yeah Monday. We're rolling into yet another week. I hope you're all full of positivity. I am, despite the fact that in there somewhere is Otis the dog. I can't even see him today. He's completely vanished. I think he learned from yesterday when I was mocking him for attempting to hide. Today, he is hiding. Little blighter. I'll try and find some cunning way of getting him out. Anyway, have a fabulous day, guys. It is Monday. So put that hat of positivity on and I'm going to go and find my dog in there somewhere. Remember, we're in this together. We'll get it done together. Maybe you can all come and help me find the dog now. Wow, hard four miles this morning. Two in an hour to motivate, to uh, get the trainers on to get out. But it is done. I think one of the reasons why it was so hard to motivate, I may have had too much wine last night. <laughs> anyway, it is finally done. And quite a big day. Check those puppies out. I finally broken them out to running and they are fabulous on the roads and on the hard trails, really good. Really, really good. Really notice the uh, the extra cushioning from my last pair. But right now, I'm off home to hydrate with a cup of tea. Oh, I'm wrecked after that. Uh, but uh, listen, guys, have a fabulous weekend. Don't forget, we are in this together, and together we'll get it done. Welcome back everybody, it's Cool Conversations here at the Barn Theatre in Sirencester. How's your week been? It's been one of those uh, topsy-turvy ones, hasn't it? We don't quite know what's going on. 
And because of that, and this is what's so exciting, there's always positives in everything we do. Because of the ease of lockdown, and I'm so excited about this, I can hardly get my words out. Because of the ease of lockdown, we have been allowed to get a guest in the theatre. This is, this is blowing my mind. Not only is it a guest in the theatre, he's one of my oldest friends. This guy, this guy has over 20 Arctic, Antarctic expeditions under his belt. He is considered one of the very best polar photographers on the planet. He's the go-to for almost every adventurer to get their portrait shot by him. In fact, he shot the front cover of my book. This guy has first ascents to his name, first crossings, first descents. He's a damn great friend. I've known him for nearly 25 years. We first met working in an outdoor shop in London. He now lives in Bristol. He's the most humble, down-to-earth, adventuring photographer you could possibly ever meet. Martin Hartley, how are you? Welcome to the Barn Theatre. Can I go now? <laughs> Thanks for having me, Kenton. That was a quite an introduction. That's what everybody says. Yeah. <laughs> now, come on. The Arctic, Antarctic, why, why the poles? Why the polar regions? Uh, well, they kept... Antarctica captured my imagination as every young boy of my generation and ones before did because of Captain Scott and Shackleton and it's the word explorer was probably one of the first words I could say as a little boy. Um, and is that, is that what you would call yourself now? Because I was looking online, it's not easy to, none of us get pigeonholed, yeah. but it's not easy to pigeonhole you is it? I don't like the word, I don't like being referred to as an explorer even though I can tick every single box because uh, exploration is about going to a place and bringing back data. That's what exploring is. It's not going to the North or South Pole. Um, so I try not to label that, not to refer to myself as an explorer, because that's now become a marketing term. Because people go on these camping holidays, fully guided camping holidays, and call themselves explorers. So I, I, I'm a photographer first, and adventurer second. So it's really interesting because obviously we've got a load of mutual friends and I think, bar none, you've shot them all. You've done the portraits for pretty much all of us. In fact, I think it was, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben Fogel rung you up one day and said, Martin, I'd like you to shoot my, shoot my portrait in the style that you shot Kenton. Is, is that right? That's correct, yes. That's, yeah. And, 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 Pretty much all of us. I mean, you've done Ran, you've done Ben Saunders, you've done myself, Ben Fogel. It goes on and on. But what is it about your... Uh, how do you do it differently? Oh, well, first of all, a massive advantage in that I'm interested in the people I'm photographing. It's a great excuse to go and meet some of my heroes, asking to take their portrait. Um, the first one, the first superstar I photographed was Mesner. Oh, wow. I was, was with Paul Egan in, in the Royal Geographic Society and I was absolutely <laughs> myself because <laughs> I grew up reading all his books and he was the first guy to do all the 14,000ers. Never thought I'd meet him. He was, was a kind of superhero. And then when you're face to face with your own real life living superheroes, then I, I don't know. It just... If you're really interested in something, you, can, you can't do anything properly unless you're really interested in it. I think. Is that the black and white one on, on, your, on your website? Yeah. Because yeah. he can be quite a belligerent character, Reinhold Messner. Yeah, well, I didn't give him time for that because I only had oh, yeah. a minute and a half to take his picture. Um, that was it. So he, didn't, he just had to sit down for 90 seconds and that was what I got. So you can't do anything well unless you're interested in it. I think that's what I'm thankful for as a photographer is that it's it's probably an addiction that feeds itself being a photographer which is a huge advantage in every situation I'm in if you don't like doing it you're not going to do it well are you no no if your heart's not in it you're not going to do it well no you're, you're going to do a, a pretty yeah. pretty pretty poor job now we, we, we're going to come back to the photography because it deeply interests me 
because uh, I know that you kind of carved a name for yourself shooting medium format, which is what my father, so my father was a photographer, he shot medium format. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a love interest, I suppose, mm. there. But I, I just want to touch upon, and I, I often say this about you, you've probably got more polo experience than most people that shout and scream about polar travel, don't you? You've got over 400 days on the ice. 400 days on the Arctic Ocean, yeah. I've probably oh, got... on the Arctic Ocean? Yeah. Oh, wow, OK, well, I, I'm misinformed. Oh. 400 days on the Arctic Ocean. Mm. That's probably more than anybody, is it not? No, I'd, I'd, well, I'm more than any photographer by about 390 days, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so th OK, th th let's just get this straight. So the Arctic Ocean, so we've got the Arctic. Mm. I, I, I'm a mountaineer, I go up. I know nothing about the polar world. So the, there is no landmass as such in the Arctic, is there? No, Antar Antarctica and the Arctic are exact opposites. Yeah. So Antarctica is a, a continent covered with ice that's two miles thick, surrounded by water. The Arctic Ocean is surrounded by landmass and it's floating ice on an ocean. Right. Nobody lives on the Arctic Ocean year round. Mm -hmm. Nobody. Um, and there's nothing when you get there, you, at the North Pole, you get to the South Pole and there's between 2,000 and 4,000 scientists living there and it's probably... But it's, it's a famous picture of the, of the, there's like a highly polished silver sphere, isn't yeah. it, that you look into and then uh, you can see. But, but didn't you take the FA Cup down there? I did take the FA Cup to the South Pole, yes. What is that all about? Um, I was sat in a meeting that I'd got a brief from the FA Football Association to, they wanted an adventure photographer to document the adventure of the FA Cup for a social media campaign. So my job, and they didn't want a sports photographer to do it, they wanted an adventure photographer. I don't know how they found me. <laughs> <laughs> they did. It was a great job, actually. So my job was photographing the fans, leaving their home, going to the match, having all every single emotion under the sun uh, at a football match, because the fans, I'm not a football fan at all, and my camera was pointed at the crowd the whole time, all the way through to the FA Cup semi-final and the FA Cup final. And it's incredible how people, you can see every single emotion, anger, hate, joy, tears of happiness, tears of sadness, people wanting fights, people just wanting to love everyone. It all happens in 90 minutes in the crowd. So it was fascinating for me because I love photographing people and but just watching the fans go up and down and up and down and up and down was amazing. So I, and in the meeting I said as a joke, well I'm off to the South Pole in a week's time, why don't we start the campaign with me taking the FA Cup down there? And that was on, I think it was on the Tuesday that meeting and they just laughed it off as a <laughs> sick joke. <laughs> and then on the Thursday at 11 o'clock at night, someone from the FA called me and said, we've just finished a meeting, if you can get the cup insured, you can take it with you on Saturday. So you, you, it was the actual cup? Yeah. So initially they asked me to get insurance to cover 8,000 quid because they've got two of them. And then It must be worth more than 8,000 pounds. Well, and then on the Friday they said, actually, we want you to take the real one. Can you get it insured for 40,000 quid? So that was relatively easy to do. It's the base that it sits on never leaves Wembley Stadium, the bit that's got all oh, the... Wow. But the actual cup... So I, I met a guy at Heathrow Airport <laughs> in a dusty corner, and he's covered in tattoos, his big thick neck, and you know piercings everywhere. And he handed over the FA Cup. Yeah, this big shiny um, black box with lovely chrome edging on it, and on a trolley, opened it, and he said, "Give me a phone, I can take pictures, send them to myself." So he took the pictures and sent them to himself. So he had some evidence of any damage, and then I picked up the cup and put it in one of those blue expedition barrels inside a horrible old green sleeping bag. And he said, what are you doing with that? I said, well, I can't take that fancy case. It's just too, it looks too precious. So I put it inside a blue barrel, uh, blue food barrel. And he said, um, that is going on the plane next to you, isn't it? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, no, that is going on the plane next to you, isn't it? I said, no, it's going to hold. And he looked at me and said, you're a f***ing idiot, and just walked off. And then I realised rather naively, the enormity of what I had, I had a national treasure on my little trolley going towards check-in. And then these two policemen approached me with big machine guns and came very close and said, what's in the blue barrel, sunshine? 
Well, had they seen the exchange? They might have done, I don't know, because we were in purposefully in a little dusty yeah, okay. corner of the airport. Um, and I said, well, I'll have to show you because you won't believe me if I tell you. No, it just tells I said, no, no, I'll get it out and I'll show you. I started to get hold of a, the, the barrel. I said, no, no, just tell us what's in there. I said, it's the FA Cup. And he looked at his mate <laughs> and looked back at me. <laughs> and he said, go on and open it. So I opened it and then pulled out the sleeping bag and then pulled out this beautiful, shiny FA Cup. Um, and he looked at me and he said, what the f*** are you doing with that? So I, I had to explain everything. And then they couldn't do enough for me. I didn't have any paperwork to yeah, go yeah. with it, but um, what did I explain? Uh, and, and so, so where did it travel? Did, did it travel with you or did it go in the hold? I mean, I assume it's too big to put in the overhead locker. Uh, yeah, it went in the hold. It went in the hold? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was quite pleased to see it at the other end. I'm sure. Yeah. Because it, uh, it, uh, about this time last year, I was lucky enough through one of my uh, sponsors, I suppose, to go to the um, European Cup final. And it was with Heineken, and mm. part of their sort of preamble, they had a drinks reception with the European Cup, this big thing. Yeah. And I touched it, um, and I didn't realise that you're not, you weren't allowed to touch it. Oh, really? There's like these big security guys around, and I touched it, it was like, oh my goodness, he's touched it, he's touched it. Uh, the security around that was super tight. And there's, there's you on your own taking the FA Cup down to um, Antarctica, I think that's incredible. Mm. Incredible. So it's, so it's 400 days on the Arctic Ocean. Ocean. Yeah. Wow. And, and, and why the... Because you've kind of specialised on the Arctic as opposed... I mean, you've been to both, mm. but you specialise on the Arctic. What's... For the layman like myself, what's the difference in terms of environment? Um, when you go to Antarctica, you go... Um, at the time of the year when, so if, from an environmental point of view, it's South Pole expeditions go at a time of the year when it's relatively warm. I mean, you can be sat in your tent and it's minus 30 Celsius outside your tent and plus 20 inside your tent because you get the benefit of the greenhouse effect. In, in the Arctic, if it's minus 40 outside your tent, it's minus 40 inside your tent. That's one climatic difference. Sorry, just explain. It. So in the Antarctic, it can be minus 30 outside, but inside your tent, it's plus 20 because of the... The greenhouse effect, yeah. So I, I, I must be... I'm, I've clearly not had enough coffee tonight. It does explain how that works. It's just, just, just the sun coming through and radiating through the tent and you're out the wind. So you're in Antarctica at a time of the year when the sun is... Uh, 30, yeah, pretty much up the whole time. Yeah, 30 degrees with the horizon, or maybe a bit more, maybe a little bit less, but it's hovering around your head the whole time. Yeah. In, in the Arctic, at the start of an expedition, the sun comes up at, say, half past nine in the morning, and it's gone below the horizon at two o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And as soon as, this, as soon as the sun goes up below the horizon, then it's, it goes, it's, there's, there's no, you don't feel any benefit from, any solar radiation benefit from, you don't feel any heat from the sun at all and you only get the benefit of solar energy from the sun in april so if you're starting an expedition at the end of february you've got the end of february all of march when it's there's you don't get any benefit from the sun it's just a light source not a heat source wow so that's quite a difference the other thing is in antarctica nowadays these south pole expeditions are managed so well from a safety and logistics point of view yeah you can be skiing along on your own, fall over, bang your head, and because you're not moving, someone will be watching you every hour, and if you're not moving, they'll come and get you. And if the weather's bad, if they can't reach you by an aeroplane, they'll get you on a... On a um, <laughs> they can drive to you on a... Yeah, but they, they've got like a polar road sort of thing, haven't they? Well, they have towards... Uh, from the... Um, South Pole to the coast for the American so that's the service road for the American uh -huh. South Pole station but you can you can drive there in a car if a car can't get you a skidoo will come and get you if a skidoo can't come and get you then you're not on the normal South Pole route so it's very safe from that point of view in the Arctic once you get dropped off on the edge of the Arctic Ocean and the plane's gone then you're on your own if anything bad happens because this ice is moving all the time and because the weather is 
so changeable up there. If anything bad happens, there's no guarantee a plane can come get you mm. in time. And and, 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 and cause I, I, well, clearly, I've seen your photographs and some films that you've shot, and it, it looks like there's pressure ridges and cracks and crevasses and open water. In the back of my mind, I have even landing an aeroplane in good weather is nigh on impossible. Mm. Whereas you, you've got the landmass of Antarctica, so it's stable and twin otters or, or you know, whatever can, can potentially land mm. within reason pretty much anyway. Is that, yeah. that right? Yeah, that's, that's about right. Um, in the Arctic, you need to get a plane to land to come and get you, you need a good patch of ice, which is hard to find, and you need good weather. And those two things don't really collide. In order to look for a good piece of flat ice, you need good weather. Um, and then when you found a piece of flat ice, <laughs> you have to wait for the weather to come good. And sometimes in that time frame, that piece of ice breaks up, so you have to move to another place where the plane might be able to land. So it's, once you, it's, it's a completely different psychological feeling being in the Arctic, knowing that if anything bad does happen, then you are on your own. You don't get that feeling in Antarctica unless you're on a special route somewhere. Wow. So, so you've almost deliberately chosen one of the most hostile. So, you, the, the poles, you know, polar regions clearly interest you from from a young age. But you, you've chosen arguably the most hostile of the two environments, certainly the most unpredictable one. Where, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to. I've got a quote here from uh, from Rand Fines. I have experienced the polar world in all its ferocity when it is a challenge just to stay alive, let alone pull out a camera and take a photograph. So, I mean, that pretty, that, that, that doesn't paint a great picture <laughs> of being on the Arctic Ocean. And then you go there in a work capacity and take photographs. It, it begs the question of why. <laughs> uh... When I first saw the Arctic Ocean the very first time, I was with Pen Haddo in 2002, I was photographing him on the very edge of the Arctic Ocean when he set off to do his solo trip to the North Pole from Canada. And I remember standing there thinking that I was looking at a sleeping giant that was a monster. It's, it's, I'm not a religious person, but you know when you go into a cathedral and automatically you have this sense of respect for the the yeah. cathedral. Yeah. You have that. I think every human being goes to a building like that and they have this aura. You can't touch it, you can't see it, but you can. there's something about being in a cathedral that you can feel and it automatically... Yeah, I think part of it is just the grandeur and the architecture yeah. and the... Yeah, there, there is certainly an awe about yeah. and then you churches look, yeah. or mosques or, or whatever it may be. So t imagine that kind of feeling, but outside, looking at something that's five million square miles in surface area, and you're looking at this enormous moving beast. It does have an effect, well, me, it has an effect on me. It's like, <laughs> hell, that's scary. And then to see Penn ski off away from me when I was taking his picture, I was thinking, that is a man walking to his death. That's what I thought I was looking at. I thought I'd never see him again. And then on the way back in the aeroplane, I was thinking, wow, I wouldn't mind trying that, seeing what that feels like. Um, so when I first went to the Arctic Ocean, I was pulled back by that sense of adventure. And that's, that's all it was. It was that feeling of being out of arms, reach of rescue, and being in a place that's wild, and you can feel the force of Mother Nature pressing on you every day. That's what I want there. I wanted to feel that. And then very quickly realised that with climate change and global warming and the disappearing ice, realised that I needed to go back there as often as possible to photograph the ice before it's gone. And a kind of 16-year <laughs> mild sense of panic that it's going to be gone before I can get back to it. And that feeling still exists in me today. That, and that sense of purpose is more powerful than feeling cold or being scared. Um, so that's what keeps me going back. Wow. Because it, it, it was, I think it was Time magazine to describe you as a hero of the environment. 
is, is that because of your continued prolonged um, championing of the plight that, of that the was, Arctic Ocean? That accolade was given to Penn and Anne and I for our Arctic surveys that we did in 2009 and 2010 when we went up onto the Arctic Ocean to... The int original intention was to work out the average volume of ice using a hand drill and a radar because that data, getting data off the Arctic Ocean is, off the surface is nigh on impossible because um, scientists don't really have the skill to spend too much time out there so, and they're craving actual ground truth which the satellites can't provide. So that Time magazine came from those two expeditions. Well, I mean, take, I, mean I, I think it's a, a hero of the environment. I, I definitely take that one. <laughs> for sure, I, I think that's epic. Now, um, it's not just the polar regions, is it? Uh, I, I was reading, I think it might be on your website, actually, uh, maritime archaeology. Oh, my God, that was amazing. I mean, that, yeah. that sound is off the charts. I mean, not only like the diversity of what the scientists were doing, but, but what you were getting up to. Um, I mean, have you got time to explain a little bit about that? that? Because I mean, that, that's a whole episode of Cool Conversations in its own right, almost. Yeah, that was an amazing, amazing experience as a photographer and as for me personally. So there was, there was three voyages that were going out onto the Black Sea um, in this research, incredible research vessel that was kitted out with hundreds of millions of pounds of tech that was designed for looking for oil sites, really. It was a, an, a research vessel to go oh. out and look for oil, but it was being chartered to, for a bunch of scientists um, as the Maritime Archaeology Project, Black Sea Map. They were trying to work out what the climate was like 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, because no one is really sure why the Black Sea formed. Uh -huh. And this research expedition, three of them, were there to drill core samples from six metres from the seabed and bring them back up and analyse them. Um, but in doing so, they discovered, using these amazing robots, um, shipwrecks on the seabed. Oh, wow. And th they would chart a course and pick likely spots for shipwrecks, and then on the way back, they'd go and look at them. So they do the coring and then they come back and they go and look at these shipwrecks. Being in the ship, in the belly of the ship, watching these computer screens as these robots go down into the blackness, waiting to see what the shipwreck is on the seabed, was, it's the kind of stuff you only see in films. And yeah. then these shipwrecks appeared out of the darkness. And one of them was from the Byzantine period, which uh, I think that's just after the Romans left power. It's... I'm embarrassed, I should know how long ago that was. Um, well, it's going to be a couple of thousand years. Isn't yeah, it? let's say a couple of thousand years. So, looking at something for the first time that no one has seen for 2,000 years. So that uh, well, are, these, are these things what, stuck in mud or are they yeah, well, on the, the seabed? Or? The bottom of the Black Sea has this, uh, what's called an anoxic layer, so there's yeah. no oxygen down there, uh -huh. so the bacteria can't reproduce, so they're in really good condition. Some of the ships had still had the masts, obviously, wow. um, and some had ropes hanging on the side of them. Uh, some of them just like piles of wood to me, but the archaeologists were going, oh my God, this is so well preserved. But the excitement of looking at something for the first time that hasn't been seen since it set sail was incredible. That's, it, that's it, amazing. It, it, and were, were you on each of the three? I did two of the journeys. Um, uh, uh, it's a shame the programme didn't have a fourth, because you could spend the entire entire, every single year going back looking for... Uh, and, and, so and your role as a photographer was, was documenting the, sort of the expedition or the... Yeah, the just documenting the scientists at work from the, from the, from the drilling and mud, the mud uh, analysis and the robots going down. Yeah, now, I, I, I know you pretty well and, and, and I, I think I'm right in saying that you're, you're a big fan of the outdoors, you're a pretty active guy, you do a bit of climbing, a bit of mountaineering, you're obviously pretty adept at sledge hauling, how did you find being cooped up on the boat for a prolonged period of time? Well, I shouldn't really say it. It was the easiest job I've ever done. Oh, really? Walking around in shorts and a T-shirt, and there was five-star food on the ship. My bed was about the same size as a cabin, was about the same size as a coffin, um, which didn't bother me. It would bother some people, but 
you know, walking around in sh shorts and t-shirt with a couple of cameras hanging around, you know, eating nice food. Um, the most difficult bit was it was a dry ship, so there was no alcohol involved. That was the biggest uh, hardship. Uh, yeah, because we're, 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 you know, we have shared the odd beer or two over the, the uh, 25 years. Can you believe it? It's 25 years. Yeah. I, was, I was trying to work it out when we were both working at Cotswolds. Okay, you must have yeah. been about 12 years old then. Uh, well, it's very kind of you to say so. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's about 25 years, because it was at the time when I think Deegan was there, Gresham had maybe just left, John yeah. Wig. There's a little all-star cast of employees at Cotswold Outdoor. Their, their head office is just up the road, actually. Oh. Um, now, um, I, I, I'm doing some notes, which uh, I know some people will find quite, um, quite bizarre, seeing I'm arguably less organised than you are. Um, which in itself will take some doing, by the way. I, I know, yeah. I know. <laughs> uh, so it, you know, it's hilarious. So whenever I go on expedition, Martin normally gets a telephone call about 12 hours before I leave, and I'm, <laughs> I'm normally trying to blag some satellite device, aren't I, to go on because uh, I, I either my sat phone is broken or I mean they completely saved our backside in Pappy a few mm. years ago. So I've got to say thanks for that. I, I, I did give it back to you, didn't I? Uh, I know you, I had it for a long time. But you I did. I've lent it to someone else now, and I've can't remember who. So. No, well, I'm pretty sure it's not me. Yeah, it's not you, no. Yeah, it's this fantastic little Iridium... Iridium Go. It? Iridium Go, which you can connect to your smartphone. It's, it's so you, I mean, it's fairly slow, but you can get text messages out. Mm. You, uh, did, did, um, you use it for pictures, don't you? It must mm. be desperately slow. Uh, transfer rate is less than one megabyte an hour, so... One megabyte an hour? Less than that, yeah, so... Oof. And it's about... I think it was about 90 quid to send back a file that was 600 pixels across. Crikey. That's quite a lot, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's quite an expensive phone call. It is. Yeah. You can see why your Arctic trips are so expensive, <laughs> uh, for sure. So, so your, your latest one's been put on hold. Mm. Uh, and that, again, was going back to the Arctic Ocean. And you were planning... It was this past February, March, been put on hold for obvious reasons. But my understanding was that you were looking for the... Was it the oldest or the last of the ancient sea ice so before it disappears? It, it sounded pretty... Well, a part of it really tugged at my heartstrings. Mm. Whenever you hear the last in conjunction with anything with wildlife or the environment, it, it kind of makes me realise what a great job we've done at destroying our planet. Mm. And I think you've seen it firsthand. Yeah. So but, you know, perhaps you can just explain what that expedition... So, was. one of the, the biggest problem the Arctic Ocean has as a geographic entity is that people don't understand it. Um, it's out of sight, it's out of mind, and those five million square miles of white, that little white cap that sat at the top of the planet, reflects back 80-odd percent of the sun's solar radiation back into outer space. So, without that little white cap, that's sat at the top of our planet, our air conditioning system is gone. Hmm. So, 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 so you say five million square miles. I mean, what, what I mean, is that? What, what I mean, try, I'm, try, I'm trying to work out the size of that. So, it, it, would that be about the equivalent of North and South America together? Or probably not that. Not probably not quite that big, is it? Um, I don't know. I don't think it matters. But I mean, it's five, whatever whatever size it is, it's doing a good job at the moment of right. reflecting back radiation back into outer space. And all the Northern Hemisphere's weather is controlled by the Arctic Ocean sea ice. Um, and once that starts to change, our weather patterns have started to change. And once those changes get bigger, f growing food in the higher latitudes is going to be so unpredictable, there's going to be food shortages. And that's only 10 years away. And these, so the Arctic Ocean sea ice, it forms in the winter and then s some of it survives the summer and then grows thicker. Right. But some of it, most of it nowadays forms in the winter, the, in the late autumn and the winter and spring and then it lasts a year and it turns into water by August. Hmm. So the multi-year sea ice, which is what I want to go back and photograph, is this amazing, spectacular not quite mountains, but huge cathedrals of ice that are between four and eight metres thick. Blocks of ice piled on top of each other. And these, these things have... They are like churches, in effect, as far as the Arctic Ocean is concerned. They are 
charismatic and they they push cold out like it feels like you're walking past the negative of a furnace no. it's it's very powerful stuff and there's less than half a percent of that sea ice left on the Arctic Ocean and only three years ago that figure was two percent so you can see how quickly it's going uh, and, and when that ancient when you say ancient I mean how, how old is it's that not ice? that old it's probably between the oldest the oldest sea ice in Arctic Ocean will be about 12 years old it's okay that's not the point it's the last kind of uh, that generation of ice the, the, the accumulation yeah. of, of ice because yeah. I'm, I'm guessing down in Antarctica that ice because it's on top of the the continent is tens of thousands of years old in comparison yeah I think it's hundreds of thousands of years old because it sort of drifts from the South Pole to the coast yeah yeah in, in a way a standard glacier would do yeah whereas in, in, I suppose you could almost say that the Arctic Ocean is a, is a floating glacier, which well, it's not even a floating glacier, isn't it? It's um, I'm, I'm doing a really bad job at describing it because <laughs> I've, I've never been there. I'm just trying to no. get my head around it. I mean, um, cl it's clear to me that you're deeply in love with this environment. Mm. And, and I, I, apart from seeing your photographs, I've never I, no, I don't really a, have a, a concept of what it's like. It's invisible, and I've I've looked on Google and everywhere looking for other pictures of the Arctic Ocean and there's a few from the edges a lot of the photographs that the press put out is a shot of a polar bear on one lump of ice yep. looking a bit bewildered that's quite normal uh, for polar bears to be standing on lumps of ice um, but it's you know it tugs on heartstrings no one's going to be affected nobody's going to notice when the last polar bear's dead but when the last piece of ice has gone, and way before the last piece of ice has gone, everyone on the planet is going to notice it. it you know, COVID-19 is a scratch, whereas in terms of a, an injury mm. uh, for, the, for the human race, but once the Arctic Ocean sea ice has gone, that's going to be a major wound that we need to repair somehow, if we can. So, Well, they're well me if we can. I mean, I, 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 I struggle to see how... Well, there's a bit of time, but there's a bit of... You know, there's, there is some hope there. With we need technology to help us not rely on fossil fuels, mm. and technology to help us take mechanically remove CO2 from. Do, the do, 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 so, so you think that's what it's going to take? We're going to need to mechanically remove. Yeah, planting trees. We haven't, we haven't got time to plant trees to to pull it out. Well, that's quite worrying. It is very, very it's <laughs> terrifying. Yeah, you don't really hear much about it, do we? No, not now. Now COVID-19 has sort of, sort of bulldozed all the climate news off the headlines. That's, that's another big problem. So, so, so your expedition to, to look at this ice, now, I, I know, because you actually invited me on it. <laughs> I remember looking through the, the dossier or the deck uh, and I was like, oh, my God, you know, I'm not sure I can manage. Why is it three months or so on the ice? Mm. Um, now, my expeditions are normally you know, five, maybe six weeks long, but, but yours are... 60, 70, 80 mm. days long. Uh, so that's been postponed to what, next year or year after possibly? Probably 2022, still fundraising for that. So no way that we're going to be able to raise enough money by this September or October. Yeah. So, um, and, and is that too late? I mean, if you said three years ago, there's 2% of ice left. And then, so are you looking in two years time, is, is there going to be any of this ice left? I'm being, I'm being hopeful <laughs> that there's going to be some lumps left. That's all we can be, really. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Wow. I can see why you're the hero of the environment. <laughs> but you, 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 you're clearly deeply passionate about it, um, massively so. Um, so let's go back to your photography. Medium format. Mm. Now I remember seeing you shoot medium. In fact, I think you might have done my portrait. I did. Years, years ago, ago in London. Yeah in medium format. God, that was Did you, uh, do you still shoot film at all? No, well, I started using medium format because I wanted the biggest resolution possible for, for, for anywhere. And there's, taking a big clumsy camera far away from home was, is, was not everyone's, every photographer's choice. But I just wanted to have the maximum density of information in a, in a picture, which 35 millimeter cameras um, have their limitations. Medium format was the most practical, next biggest. Because I, I remember you shooting me, and I think you were using a Mamiya. Mm. 
which my father used to use. Oh, right. So, uh, yes. And so he used to use a medium format Mamiya. Yeah. Uh, I just remember you taking my photograph, and I can't remember if my father was alive or not at the time, but, but it, yeah, it tugged at my heartstrings. Oh, that's good to know. It's like a true craft of photography. You can't tweak it once you, know, once you press a shutter. It's yeah, so right I've, I feel quite sorry for photographers who are coming, going to college now, and they haven't got their feet or their toes dipped into the film world. Because that's where all the romance is. It's, there's nothing romantic about photographing a digital image. Yeah. So when I was going on the, on the expedition in 1999, that well, was... that one to the Pamirs with Deegan? Yeah, with Deegan, yeah. It, it, that boy changed my life with that expedition. and blame him for everything, really. Really? Yeah. But, but you, you, were, you were taking photographs before that because age 17, you were runner-up or winner of the Young Wildlife Photographer of the Year? Runner-up, yeah. Now, I've been to that exhibition because it's now in the um, Natural History Museum once, yeah. once a year, and we go most years. So even at that early age, 17, you must have been quite exceptional. Well, I think the standards were a lot, the standards were a lot lower then, and I think all... Not no, being unkind. You're just being humble as ever. I, I, don't, well, I don't believe that for a second. I mean, technology may have changed, but the, the talent is... The, the pool of talent, I don't think, has changed. I, th I think none of the pictures from that exhibition would survive in today's competition. Anyway, um, I'm quite glad about that because, rather ironically, I didn't notice it at the time, but the, the photograph I took was a landscape image and it was some ice that had formed in a field not far from where I lived in Rochdale and the ice hasn't formed since. It just formed that one year, massive great big icicles. Wow. Um, and that's where I met David Attenborough. Oh, well, at the at the awards. Yeah. Wow. So it's all kind of all coming together from that mm. photograph, isn't it? You, mm. So you meet David Attenborough. You know, Sir David Attenborough, as we know, is like arguably the, the greatest champion that we've ever had for the environment. The picture is of ice. Yeah. It's you know, it, it's a photography. There's all these strands coming together. I mean, yeah. perhaps that was the the, the moment that your destiny was defined? Um, no, I, th I think... Because at that time, I wanted to be a wildlife photographer, which I, I would never be, because I don't have the patience. Well, I, I know some of the people you, you photograph. I mean, they're, they're borderline. Yeah, <laughs> animals. I mean, Sean Conway. I've Sean, yeah, he's definitely an animal, yeah. yeah. I've seen some of the pictures of Sean Conway. We <laughs> had him on the show last week, actually. He's, he's not looking quite as hairy as he has in the past. Mm -hmm. Was, was, is, is it your shot of him that he looks like a lion? Is that one of yours? Uh, he looks like a lion in every picture, doesn't he? Does, he? Yeah. 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 Um, so, just go back to David Attenborough for a second. I had a picture taken in 1987 at the Natural History Museum on my phone, which I've kept, of me meeting him. Uh, and I was at Heathrow Airport a couple of years ago with Anne Daniels. And Anne Daniels gave me a pass to go in the business lounge. We're going up to the Arctic. And I'd had a couple of beers, and I saw this guy at the coffee machine, and he's back to me. I thought, Fuck, that's, that's David Attenborough. I could just recognise the back of his head, and he's, that, he wears that horrible baggy jacket. And I waited for him to turn around. It was. And I went up to him and said, uh, Mr Attenborough, um, you won't remember me, but we met in 1987. And he looked a bit confused, and I had the picture on my phone. I said, look, that's you and me meeting it. Wow. That's Western Museum. Yeah, well, 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 um, what, what was his reaction? When, when, once he put... He was quite surprised. He said, well, thank you for keeping me close to your heart. I thought that was the nicest thing he could have said. <laughs> uh, you've always got to be so careful about doing that. I remember I'd done a big cycle race across, um, uh, I think it was the Pyrenees, and one of the guys handing out awards at the end, so it was like an eight-day stage race, and at the end was uh, Greg Lamont. The, I think it was the two or maybe three times Tour de France winner. And uh, when I was growing up, he was one of my heroes. And there he is, you know, at, at the dinner at the end, saying, well done, everybody. And I also had a few beers. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to go up and say hello. <laughs> so I went up and introduced myself. And he looked at me and... How, and did, I said, you, oh, how did you introduce yourself, by the way? I, I just said, hey, Greg, you know, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to meet you. And, and he looked at me and said, Why? And I didn't quite know what to say. I'm like, oh, oh, I, I need... To, uh, for making my childhood so exciting. Because, you know, he was the yeah. guy that famously beat Laurent Fignon by eight seconds. Um, 
And I said, yeah, for making my childhood so, uh, so exciting. And he looked at me, and th this is where you kind of forget, he's not that much older than we are. And he looked at me and said, oh, your childhood, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and of course I felt about this big. <laughs> So, so I think Sir David Attenborough was a lot more gracious than yeah. perhaps Greg was. Well, he's quite a bit older than me, to be fair. I mean, I might, well, look, yeah, I might look 90. 90, yeah. 91, 92 now. Mm. And so, uh, I still do. I mean, his, uh, his delivery to Davos uh, last year, mm. uh, yeah, sensational. Yeah. Absolutely sensational. And a, 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 I, mean, I assume a, a hero, or a, 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 perhaps not a mentor, but I mean, he's such a pillar of... Yeah champion of the environment it's it's incredible so 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 what's next i mean obviously you, you know you, you're looking forward to your potential what, what do you call it the sentinel the Last Arctic sentinel expedition, expedition. Mm. so probably not next year unless you know a, a huge benefactor comes along uh, in the next couple of months because i'm guessing that these expeditions take quite a lot of organization despite I, mean, yeah. I, I got the knowledge knowing that you don't have any organisational skills. No, I've got... Um, <laughs> so I, I assume that you have a team to do that for you. Yes, yes, I do, actually, yeah, because if it was down to me, nothing would happen. Yeah. I've just got, just got the idea that's the important thing. Yeah. Um, but a lot of work. Yeah. And the scientific programme is quite big, and that needs a lot of massaging to get that fully operational. So it's not just to go and photograph mm. the ice. There's a, lot of, there's a huge science programme attached to the expedition as well. And there's well, it's four of you, or that's a plan? That's a, yeah, uh, yes, four, maybe a cameraman as well, which is five, which is quite well, big. When you say camera, it's all film camera, film, it's film, all film 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 movie camera. Movie camera, well. yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah, because that's not really, because you, you, you are, you're known as a stills camera, and I know yeah. that you have done movies, because did, did you not go to, Cam Chatner, I remember I got a telephone call off you ages ago saying, um, can I borrow some skis? I'm going to ski <laughs> some volcanoes in Cam Chatner. Yeah, that's like, right. Cam where? Yeah, I'm off to ski some volcanoes in Cam Chatner. I'm like, yeah, I've got some skis you can borrow. Can you ski? And he said, no. <laughs> and you're going in about two weeks' time. Yeah, that was a funny phone call. Um, uh, because you were shooting movie on that, were you not? Um, no, I wasn't, actually. Um, although I might have been asked to do some, but I probably declined. Um, that was a funny phone call. So someone from Burkhouse, uh, Julie Pickering, called me up and asked me if I was available in March to go and photograph this f first snowboard descent of a mountain, uh, uh, um, for nearly 5,000 metre mountain in Kamchatka. Um, and can you ski? So knowing full well, I couldn't, but I thought... You just said yes. I said yes, I could ski, yes. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> So that, then I went away to Chamonix to do a very intensive survival skiing course. So um, combat skiing, combat skiing. Yes. So I was <laughs> myself, thinking. My thinking was, well, if I'm going to take a picture, I'm going to be stood still with my camera. That's all I thought about. I'm not going to be skiing, taking pictures. But I know guys do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But not me. And I thought if I can just get down something without killing myself, that's probably enough. And it, I didn't tell that to Julia Pickering, who was the lead of the expedition, well, until, until I got to Kamchatka, because I said, <coughs> way, I can't really ski. I can probably get down most things, but I can't actually ski. Um, so I was spent my entire time quite scared when I was on the skis. Mm. Or planks, as you think you called them. Yeah, planks. Mm. But, 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 I mean, I've I, I seen some of the, the imagery from that, because you, you had pretty bad weather, did you not? Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic place. The, the wind never really dropped below... 100 miles an hour, which... 100 miles an hour? Yeah. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Which was, was great for the photography. Um, we didn't do any... I think we got up to Camp 1 on the mountain, and that's, it was too windy to go any higher. There's all pictures, and they are your, like, classical, yeah. uh, conical volcano. But it's still active or dormant? Yeah, this, yeah that this one. It's still active? Yeah. Wow. So... Camp, Camp Chatton is like far, far east Russia. Yeah, it's as far east as you can go. It's so, sort of opposite Alaska, hmm. but it's Russia. So, yeah, that little snake of land that comes down the far east coast. Wow. So That's epic. Yeah. I just love, I love that. Can, can you ski? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah that, 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 was, uh, that was pretty out there. Now, um, so you go to these amazing places... 
Now, I, I, I'm just so in awe of cameramen. I mean, I, I work quite a lot on and off with cameramen. I don't work with you enough. I take most of my photographs on this. Um, and I was listening to an interview that you were doing uh, yesterday or today or sometime like that. And you were saying that the cold doesn't really affect cameras. Now, I whipped this out on the top of Everest, and the battery in this would die in about a nanosecond. So when you said that the cold doesn't really affect cameras, do you want to elaborate on that? Yes, yeah, so, no, the, um, the camera's not affected by the cold, but the batteries are. Uh, OK, got you. So the batteries and those things are just the useless yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I keep it sort of stuffed down in, in my down suit with a like a hot water bottle, so yeah. to speak. And you get it out and it's on like 60% or so. And by the time you do that, it's down to 20%. Yeah. And by the time you realise you've got to take your glove off, it's dead. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the most infuriating things ever. Yeah, so batteries just get very efficient when it's cold. But you can leave a battery at the South Pole and then go back the following year if it's fully charged warm it up and it'll work. Oh, really? It, it, it doesn't leak its charge? They don't leak charge, it's just, no, they just become really inefficient when they're cold. Oh, wow. Huh. And, and for any budding photographers out there, I mean, what, what are the other pitfalls? I remember my father was shooting in a, because um, he, he was there for about a week, in a, uh, like a butcher's cold store yeah. thing. And he was saying that he would go in there and there are real issues with fogging. Yeah, that's a nightmare going... And, and trying to... So the batteries would... would they had issues with... The, this is years ago. So they had yeah. issues with the batteries and the lights and everything else. So it was constantly going in and out, in and out. And, of course, everything would fog up. Yeah, that's the worst thing to do. So you can go from, you can go from hot into cold. You can't go from cold into hot. Because uh, okay. it's, the, it's the humidity that gets in the lenses that stops the cameras working. And then if the humidity gets... So I keep, I leave all my kit outside, where, how, wherever I am. The kit stays outside the tent. Oh. I just bring in um, the two batteries I'm using, and I've got a little pocket camera, and I have an iPhone as well. I use that inside a tent, um, and warm that little pocket camera up over the stove so it's the same temperature as the tent, and then that's okay. But if humidity gets inside a camera and freezes, then it ruins the circuit boards inside the camera so just leave everything outside everything and, and the from well from what i've seen looking at films and pictures and you know talking to the likes of Randall Fiennes and to a certain extent yourself the environment in the arctic ocean is not it's not dry is it i mean everything seems to be well you're on an ocean so it's 100 percent humidity yeah. and when you breathe out have these clouds of steam in front of you. So if you want to take a picture and there's no wind and you're puffing out like a steam engine, you either have to step to the side and photograph past the, the oh, steam really? cloud. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So, so uh, yeah, of course, yeah, because if you breathe out, you've got the condensation cloud. Yeah. And you, you, and you literally have to step away from it. Yeah, or hold your breath, which is a bit annoying if you're trying to catch it with everyone else. So... And, and how does that work on an expedition? So, so, so you're there... And you're dragging these, these big polks, the big sledges behind you, and you are an integral part of the expedition, but you're also running around taking photographs. Mm. So, A, I mean, are you getting a team to stop and wait, or are you working around them? Is it a joint thing? I'm trying to work out how dynamics work. Uh, well, I, I like to hang out at the back, because then I've got people in front of me to photograph. And if mm. I don't want the people in, I'll photograph somewhere else if I just want to have ice and no people. So um, I just hang around at the back. Um, and if I get distracted by taking pictures, then I'll just have to catch up. You kind of make it sound like you're going down to the shops. <laughs> I just hang out at the back. <laughs> I quite like it there. Because um, you, can't, you, can't, you don't really speak on a, on a North Pole trip because um, there's usually... 100, 200, 500 metres between you and the next person. As far as that, you're not concerned about crashing through the ice at all? If there's, a, if there's an obstacle and it's going to be dangerous to cross, then people do concertina and come together to work out how to cross it safely as a team. But in between those gaps, you just, you're in your own world most of the time. 
I've been rubbish at that. I, 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 I can't <laughs> believe that I even gave your, 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 your kind invitation. I, I mean, I thought about it quite hard for a few days. The more I hear about it, the... the, the oh, you'd love it, can't you? I'm not entirely sure I yeah. would. So you've got to keep the, 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 the batteries warm, but the camera itself is... Yeah, as, as long as you don't get the condensation inside, you've always got your condensation cloud that you need to move out from. I mean, what, what, what are the other pitfalls shooting? Uh, so autofocus doesn't work. Below minus 25, everything sh starts to shrink, and the tolerances in the lenses are not built to withstand that much shrinkage, so you have to switch back to manual focus. Um, that's one thing. Keeping humidity out of the lenses is quite difficult. So you have to really nurse them to make sure you don't get condensation from your own breath into the lens or from um, anything near the tent. Um, you can't really change lenses if, it's, if there's snow blowing around because if snow gets in your camera, it condenses on the chip inside the camera, then you get everything covered in a million black dots and then that's your life over when you get back and retouching. <laughs> and you get cold fingers. You think your hands get absolutely frozen solid. But I was going to say, I mean, how, how can you work? I mean, on top of Everest, it's maybe on a cold day, minus 20, 25 with a bit of wind chill. It's no more than that. Probably a bit, probably oh. a bit less. But I mean, when I say less, you know, it's probably warmer than that. Uh, but it sounds like it's properly brutally cold, and you're operating without gloves on with your camera? No, I have these massive big mitts to light oven, oven gloves. You probably have the same things when you're... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, but you can't do anything with them. I certainly can't no. take a photograph with them. No, you can't, so you have to... I have mine around a, a leash around my neck, so I can get my hands out of them. They're really big, so I can just put my hands in them if... Get, get them on and off really quickly, which is why they're oversized. But if... Um, and they're on a leash because when you're taking pictures, I've got some... I have... Uh, thin thermal gloves on my hands to manage the buttons on the mm. camera um, which gives you about if it's w if there's a bit of wind it gives you about 30 seconds to put the battery in the camera get the aperture and the shutter speed correct take a picture put the gloves back on but if it's if it's taking a while or I'm just getting carried away taking more pictures and my hands get cold there does come a point where you can't even do the pincer movement so there are the mitts on my neck, so I can just push my hands into them without having to pull them on. Wow. So... Uh, and do you have chemical hand warmers in there or anything like that? Yeah, I do or? use hand warmers, yeah. Because um, I'm guessing, because uh, looking at your fingers, you, you've got ten fingers. I mean, there's no obvious signs of frost damage. I presume that there has been minor frost damage, because I've experienced mm -hmm. that. Uh, but you've got ten fingers, two thumbs, etc., etc. So you, you, you must be pretty diligent. Yeah, I'm quite lucky. Uh, I've got good circulation in my hands, but they do. It's very, very, very easy to get frostbite on your fingers. Well, really, look, I mean, we, we, we've both got the mutual friend Ranulph Fines. <laughs> yes. uh, he's, he's got no no fingers on his his left hand, isn't it? Yeah. Trying to write yeah. a because that was in the Arctic Ocean. Yeah. That was trying to write a um, a pulp that had crashed through the ice. Yeah. And he had to make the decision. He was telling me once he had to make the decision when his right hand went in to put it over and he decided his left yeah, hand. Yeah, I'd go for my left hand all the, every time, just yeah. like he did, for obvious reasons. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, he, he's got no fingers and that was... He said it was instantaneous. Mm. Um, and he, I suppose it, to a certain, certain extent. I mean, he makes a jolly good story in many of his books that he cuts it off with a fret saw, uh, number one fret saw, he claims. But um, yeah, you know, he's going to dramatically alter your life, especially for somebody like yourself as a photographer. I mean, mm. frost damage is... Could be a bit of a no-no. Yeah, it's, easy, it's very easy to get. I've had it in my feet three times just from sheer clumsiness. That didn't surprise me. <laughs> I didn't realise it was so warm at the top of Everest. I thought it was quite cold. No, not really. Uh, I mean, a lot, a lot of, you know, everybody thinks Everest is going to be minus 30, minus 40 or even more, but you know, we're, we're, we're pretty diligent with the weather forecasting. So we, we get really good weather forecasts. And, and if it's not great, it's not like you on the ice where you are kind of stuck there in that environment. We only dip our, you know, our toe into it very, very briefly, uh, so so we can pick and choose a little bit. So when you're going from South Cole to the summit and you've got these amazing down suits on, are you not overheating the yeah. whole time? You are. Yeah, uh, massively so. Oh. Almost from the word go. 
to, to, to try to get your ban it, it, it'd be terrible in the Arctic mm. uh, because sweating in or my understanding you know sweat in Arctic or Antarctic is you, you don't want that at all well you can but sweat all day in Antarctica and then dry stuff out at night in your tent yeah but you can't but do and that. And ironically in the Arctic one of the key things is keeping cool not keeping warm oh you overheat yeah I, I, saw, I saw some video that you had some specially made garment oh, and they yeah. put the wicking material back to front. Yeah. And there, there's some, I, I'll try and find the video. And, and you're literally smashing this jacket because it's frozen <laughs> because instead of wicking the moisture away, it's kind of doing the exact opposite. It must be wicking the moisture. Yeah. Uh, you have done your homework, haven't you? I'm very impressed. <laughs> But it's kind of what we do here. I mean, not, you know, we're not just completely machine gunning these things. We're doing a modicum of... Well, we, we like to know our guests. Uh, Martin, we like to know our guests. Um, but, yeah, that, that looked hilarious. You, you had this frozen jacket, and uh, the, the video looked like it's been edited over a period of time, and you're literally there smashing it to try to get it on. And it, I was curious why you were even trying to pull it on. Was that the only jacket you had? Yeah, that's the only thing, the only thing I had. God, it must have been purgatory. That was on one of the, the trips with Penhado. Yeah, that was 2009. So that jacket, um, like you said, they wicking... I didn't realise until a year later when somebody from Montaigne came to look at it with a view... It, it wasn't made by Montaigne, right. by the way. Um, you are very quick to put that in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nothing to do with them at all. In fact, they saved the day because they, the, they turned it inside out and looked at it and the guy said to me, why is the wicking fabric the wrong way round? And then the penny dropped. I thought I was just Sweat, sweating, sweating too much. Or oh, were you the only one on the team that had that issue? Yeah. Oh. I thought was. I thought I had a physical problem by sweating, so I tried everything. Tried to wear nothing underneath it. Tried to ski along with freezing colds, trying not to sweat, and that was quite uncomfortable as well. Um, and then over the course of 30, 40 days, my sweat just accumulated inside the jacket and didn't go anywhere, and that turned to ice. And I had this big sort of um, belt, like a life belt of ice, like a big donut around my waist, where it had fallen down inside the jacket and accumulated there. So I had to cut the bottom of the jacket open to get all the ice out. Um, and I took it off at night, because you do that when you get in the tent, and I put it on in the morning, and it was all the sweat had f from the previous 30 days was still in there and just turned to ice. So I did have to bash it around so I could soften it up to get it on. I, I suppose the only good thing about that is because it's freezing every night, it's probably not stinking that much, is it? Uh, yes. or, or did it thaw out? But, but then you're on your own. You're 500 metres from the other yeah. one. You're just there in your own aroma. You probably quite enjoyed that. Um, because it's so cold, the bacteria can't really reproduce. Oh, well, that's handy then. So quickly as it does. I mean, you do smell. When you go back into a building afterwards, you do smell pretty horrid. But you can't smell anything out there at all. Huh. I don't know what it's like when you come down from the summit with the... Oh, no, it's yeah, we stink. Yeah. Do you? Yeah, yeah, no, it's pretty bad. And we're, we're, we're only gone five days in base camp normally. Uh, not five days, seven days. Seven days okay. in base camp. Yeah. Yeah, we, we're pretty efficient. Yeah, we, we're in and out there. Yeah, we, we, we got it. Well, we, we got it dialed. <laughs> now, I, I was reading somewhere, what are your most famous photographs? And there's loads. I mean, there's oh, so much. Um, I mean, we, we'll be doing okay on time in a moment. There's so much I want to talk to you about, about the photography. Uh, you got an his epic photograph of Pen Haddo skiing away from you. And it looks like he's on top of the world because you've used a, a pretty ferocious fisheye. And I was reading somewhere that you found a stepladder to take it on. Where do you find a stepladder in the Arctic Circle or in, in the Arctic Ocean? Well, <laughs> I'd arranged for one to be put in the aeroplane. Ah, uh, got that you. Dropped pen out, that dropped pen off on the edge of the Arctic Ocean. Uh, but exactly like that yellow one there, actually. Exactly the same one. Well, perhaps, perhaps that's the one. Maybe, um, yeah. Perhaps we can auction that off to save our <laughs> barn theatre. We pretend it's been to the, uh, the Arctic Ocean. So uh, I arranged a step ladder because I knew that with a fisheye lens, <coughs> the higher you get, the, you, the more you point the camera down, the bigger arc you can get on, a, on the horizon. Right, it just, just looks epic. Yeah. I mean, we'll, 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 we'll get it in the show. It, 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 it's phenomenal. And the thing that really 
strikes me about it, it looks like really blue ice. Is that what Arctic ice is like? Um, well, yes. It, I was trying to have a conversation yesterday about it, but sea ice is... sound a bit geeky now. Sea ice is cyan, not blue. Glacier ice is blue. That's fresh water ice. Right. All glacier ice is fresh water ice. And right. it's something to do with there not being any air in, in the ice. It's all been pushed out, which is why why it's blue. Huh. Sea ice is cyan. Uh, be because of the air bubbles? I assume so. Uh, and that's why the scientists are so interested in Arctic ice, then, because they're looking at past... Because it's something to do with... Oh, no, I'm getting, I'm getting my, my Antarctic and uh, Arctic mixed up now, aren't I? Top be bit, bottom bit. <laughs> yeah, because scientists, they want the Antarctic ice because it has, it has the air bubbles in and they can look at ancient environments through the deposits in those in the ice. Yeah, they can check CO2 levels and oxygen levels yeah. in the atmosphere hundreds of yeah. thousands of years ago. But that's the Antarctic. That's the bottom bit, yeah. Yeah. That's where the penguins live. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for saying. <laughs> I know I was looking at you when I said that, but it wasn't directed at you. But <laughs> people do get it wrong. I, I'm going to go, so my children are going to watch this. I'm going to get home and they go, duh, dad. <laughs> Of course the penguins live down there. Everyone gets confused because the polar bears and penguins, the only place they ever meet is on Christmas cards. That's why everyone... Well, no, I know the confused. polar bears live, live up north because I, I was on a trip to Greenland and we spent like 12 hours on a rib to get to a beach that we wanted to get dropped off, myself and uh, to a couple of clients to do some new routes. And we'd been 12 hours on a rib and we get to this beach in the middle of nowhere and there's a polar bear and a cub on the beach. Couldn't believe it. So we scared it off with the, uh, with the outboard <laughs> and then yeah, humped the gear inland a little bit because the polar bears generally stay on the coastline. Mm. And then we were given all that polar bear oh, like safety, safety equipment, which, yeah. to be perfectly honest, is about as useful as a chocolate teapot. <laughs> it's, not, it's not particularly good, is it? No. So we, we, we were given a... Um, so, so the way it worked out on our... I mean, do, do you bother with polar bear um, surveillance equipment, for want of a better word? In, in no, we just take a big high-powered rifle with us. That's so, so, so we were given a... Um, we, we were told that you've got to peg out... Oh, the... And, and then you, you put a, a string round your camp, and then the string went into a rape alarm, and the idea is that polar bear comes through, sets it off, and then you've got time to react with a flare or get the gun out or whatever it is. Um, so, so we tried this one night, say night, of course it doesn't get dark there. Uh, so we tried it, so one of the clients was sleeping, uh, and, we, and we, set the, <laughs> we set the rape alarm. He just slept through it. Yeah. He didn't actually wake up. Because snow absorbs sound very well, so the rape alarms might be deafening here, but they just go doo doo, doo, -doo <laughs> when they're surrounded by snow. Um, when Ben did his, Ben Saunders did his North Pole solo in his circle 2004 expedition i was at the airport with him and andy ward putting his expedition sledge through the um check-in and ben realized he had 12 mini explosive devices for his polar bear fence he was going to put around his tent it was a trip wire and if the polar bear tripped the wire this explosion would go off. And they were like mini hand grenades, and he had about 12 of them in his sledge, gently hoping, pushing it through, um, you know, when you check your bag in. Yeah, um, like a scanner. Yeah, like a, yeah, but they didn't get picked up, so... You're kidding. No, so Ben has actually smuggled explosive devices through Heathrow Airport unknowingly. Well, but, but it's like all those things. I mean, you're not supposed to take the compressed... CO2 canisters when you're bike racing and things like that. Yeah, they're, ones, they're punch yeah. repair. I mean, I, I've flown with them unknowingly mm. and, and they've, they've been through. Yeah. Meanwhile, I was flying back from Moab in the uh, Utah desert last year and they took the, um, the fuel bottle, which I, the uh, like petrol fuel bottle for my stove, which I've been diligent. I washed out with like soap and water and then put stones in it and oh, sloshed yeah. it all out. And that came up on the scanner and they opened it smelt it, I mean, it's completely empty, yeah. 
and they confiscated that, the, the stove pump. They wanted to confiscate, confiscate the stove, but that's quite expensive, so I, yeah. I haggled to get that bit back. Uh, it, it's, it's amazing what goes... It, yeah. I mean, on expeditions, it's amazing sometimes what does get confiscated and then what doesn't get confiscated at airports. It never ceases to amaze me what yeah. sometimes gets taken. I mean, I was flying back from um, Pakistan once. This is years ago. And for some reason, I don't know why, I had the, I'd taken the picks off my ice axes. So I just had the shafts. And they were in my hand luggage. And I don't know why I put them in my hand. I was like 19 or so. So this is years ago. Uh, and I got stopped in, I don't know, Tashkent or somewhere. I was trying to, uh, multiple flights to get home from Pakistan. And it goes through a scanner and, of course, it goes off. All my friends go through. And I get taken off to one side by a... I mean, he looked like KGB agent. He's got the he's got the aviator sunglasses on, all dark. He's smoking cigarettes. He's got uh, a crap-looking sort of suit on. <laughs> it takes. I'm 19. I'm petrified. Takes me to one side, and he takes the ice axe uh, ice axes out, and he says, "You know, what are these?" I'm trying to explain what they are, and we just sit there, and I don't quite know what's going on. And I'm looking at my my watch, and the plane's about to leave, and I'm trying to get. The, and he says, "No." We will keep you here. Uh, well, uh, but my friends are on the plane. And he just looks at me and goes, $100. Um, what? He goes, 100 you know, He's uh, openly, you know, $100. Uh, and, and then he just walks off. That's lots of money, man. And they all run back on the plane. <laughs> um, yeah, so, but all my friends had exactly the same thing. They all had their uh, ice axes in their hand luggage and all got away with it. So you've got a dodgy looking face, Kenton. Well, that's, that's exactly what it is. Untrustworthy. That's exactly <laughs> what it is. Um, uh, God, there's so much to talk So, um, years ago, you very kindly gave me one of, I think, one of your most amazing images. And I think it's taken in a Mongolian tea house. And you blew it up for me. And it's about this oh, big. Oh, yes, that one. Yeah. It's massive. Oh. And I've, I've got it beautifully flamed, and it's, it's on the wall of the house at home. Mm. Um, and I, again, I was reading somewhere about it, and it was at a puja ceremony, I believe. And if people don't know what a puja ceremony is, it's like a big religious... It's normally a blessing of some sort, yeah. a puja. And it was said that this puja, this particular puja, went on for hours and hours and hours. And you were too polite to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so you sat through the whole thing, and that's when you snapped this most incredible photograph. Hmm. And what I love about it is that you've caught... you just caught the, the human element. I, 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 I can't articulate it. I mean, I'm, I'm not as artistic or as romantic as you are. But the, the, the little boy is... is, is He's just glancing into the camera, and the elders are all sat there, and it looks like they're drinking butter yak, you know, that, that rancid mm. yak butter tea. It's quite remarkable, that photograph. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on there. Um, so, yes, I was too polite to leave, but I felt so... I was dressed in a one-piece red windsuit... Classy. ..with this really expensive camera that no-one else in the room probably had any assets that were that expensive. So I felt very, very, very self-conscious. So I just sat at the back, in the dark, not moving, because I didn't want to disturb the, the prayer that they were reciting for four or five hours. Um, and I only had four or five frames in my camera, because at the start of the trip, I'd blown all my film budget on photographing a festival, festival, stupidly. So, and I was, what you see in that picture is exactly what I saw. And it was a beautiful, incredible, I was invited into that home as a guest. So, not, not out of any imposition, I didn't, on their part, but I did feel like I shouldn't be there, which is hence, I just sat at the back as still as I could whilst all this prayer stuff was going on. Um, and 
every, per every man in the village gets invited into this home once a month. And the monk comes down, the chief monk comes down from the mountains and bangs the gong and throws uh, flour or rice or something. Yeah, it, 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 could, it could be sampo, it could be, yeah. could be, could be rice, yeah. Yeah, offerings to the gods. But all the blokes are drinking Chang. Yeah. So they're all pissed by the end yeah. of it. Um, yeah, just, just, just point out, Chang is like a, a, is a rice beer. Yeah. Uh, it comes in various strengths and various uh, palatable quantities. You've probably drank a lot of that, haven't you? Yeah, I'm not a great fan of Chang, oh. especially the warm Chang. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that, very alcoholic. But that picture, um, I don't normally feel proud, but uh, last year that picture won Portrait of Humanity Prize. It was a global photographic competition arranged by Magnum, the BJP, and that was one of the 50 winners. So I was wow. out of about 50,000, so I was quite pleased with that. Well, I'm not surprised. Uh, it is a... Uh, I mean, I, I look at it every single day, and I see something new in it every time I look at it. Yeah. Well, we've, we've both got Paul Deegan to thank for that, because he organised that trip. Uh, was that the Pamir's trip again? No, that was... Um, that but, was but it's taken in Mongolia, is it not? No, it's taken in northern, northern India, as far north in India as you can go. So Paul arranged that Zanskar river trip. And you, you can't take that picture again, because the culture has evaporated. Well, they put a road in, have they not, ne yeah. next to the Zanskar? So, so it, it, was that the, the frozen river track? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you've done that. Mm. Oh, I'm quite jealous now. Now I'm properly jealous. <laughs> I mean, that's a trip I've always wanted to do. And there's a beautiful film, isn't there, following like a little boy walking along it somewhere uh, i might have to dig that out yeah there is it's, uh, you can still do it it's just you might have trucks and yeah well it kind of take takes yeah. away the all the wildlife has gone from the valley and it's probably diesel spillages from the road builders and it's probably not as pristine as it was hmm. i love that photograph yeah i gotta say thank you thank you you know so much for that now um i've got so much i want to talk about i, I, I don't quite know 40 most influential nature photographer of the year. That's an accolade that's been levelled at you. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it's 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 relentless. <laughs> you're you're you're, you're, you're kind of like the dark. You're like the special forces <laughs> of sort of adventure photography. So, so few people seem to really know about you. Yet you transcend so many different parts of our uh, community. I, I just think it's remarkable. And I'm making me embarrassed. I'm going to have a little cry in a minute if you keep going like that, Kenton. No, but, but honestly, it's, <laughs> you know, it, and it, maybe it's because you learnt your craft with film and you realise how precious each image that you're capturing is. You said about the, the one in North India and the, mm. the sand skies. So you only had like four or five um, like exposures left. Because you probably... Had, I, I remember I used to go on expedition and I used to shoot Velvia. Yes. Um, and, you know, you take, like, say, ten rolls of film. And yeah. that's it. That's, that's, that's it. all the film you had. Yeah. Whereas now you just go... I know. Well, on that particular, on that Zanskar trip, where I ran out of film at the start, before the expedition started... <coughs> bit foolish. Bit foolish, <coughs> bit of a knob. I had 30 rolls of Provia film, that was it. And I had four or five frames a day for the rest of the, whatever it was, 30 days. And to get rid of that psychological itch of taking a picture, I had to keep one camera, I had a couple of cameras, empty. So when I'd shot my budget for the day, I'd still take pictures on the camera that didn't have any film in. Because no. it was the only way I could scratch the itch of taking wow. a picture. So God, that really is a passion, then. Well, it's a kind of addiction. I can't, I've tried putting my camera away on day 70 of an expedition. I'll just have an hour off. I'll just not take any pictures for an hour. I can last about 20 minutes before I have to get it out. God. Impossible not to. So I'm quite happy about that, because it means I'm never going to get bored. Because ex polar expeditions are really boring. I don't well, know how... Yeah, I, 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 mountaineering expeditions can be the same. You know, there, there's a lot of, I think, adventure. Mm. Generally, there's a lot of people don't realise how much sitting around there it's is. Not very glamorous at all. No, it's it? not. Um, Although you make it glamorous, Canton, you make it very glamorous. Well, that, that, that's, 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 that, yeah. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. So um, we've got to sort of somehow land this beast. And, and, and so I've, I've not really touched the surface. Uh, something I do need to hit you up on. You normally turn up in a epic looking Defender 90. And then today you rocked up in a soft top VW Beetle. Uh, not the old one, which would have been cool, mm. but a new one. Just, just, just talk me through that. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you got like a... I mean, people offer you money for your Land Rover in car parks. That's how <laughs> epic it is. Nobody's going to offer you anything for that Beetle in the car park. That is very true. So my, my lovely Pamela, she's called. Oh, I didn't know she had a name, yeah, Pamela. Pamela. Is that after Pamela Stevenson or is that after um, uh, Pamela Anderson? Not Pamela Stevenson. Pamela Landy. Oh, not come across Pamela Landy. Jason Bourne films, that CIA oh, okay, agent. Yeah. She's called Pamela Landy. So. Oh, right, okay, with you. So I Keep that up, up 007. Yeah, so. okay, got you. Yeah, so that's in hospital at the moment. It's undergoing major surgery, the Land Rover. What, what's wrong with it? Um, chassis knackered, knees welding, uh, head gasket's gone, needs a new cam mm. belt. The back brakes are seized. Use your Land Rover stuff. Yeah, what engine you got in it? Um, it's a TD90. Um, it's the last one they made before they put any ele electronics in. Uh, um, it's a TDI. I've got a feeling head gaskets are fairly common on those things, i.e. go in. Oh, well, that's, that's reassuring. So it doesn't sound that major. Anyway. Anyway, but, but, uh, my, my son loves your Land Rover, so yeah. that's, that's a seal of endorsement for it right there. I may be wrong on this, I'm going to have to read it out to get it right, but uh, I did uh, pick this up from somewhere, and I hadn't read it before, and I love this, and it just elevates you even higher in my esteem. This is your favourite quote, apparently. Oh. Only those who risk going too far can possibly find out how far one can go. T.S. Eliot. Mm. I love that quote. And I think given the person that you are and what you've done and how far you've taken your photography, I think that sums you up so eloquently. So I'm not surprised that that's your favourite quote. Thank you for Thank being you. a guest on Cool Conversations. Martin. Thank you, Canton. Brilliant. Good to see you again, sir. How was that for you? Uh, painful, listen to all those compliments, but thank you. Oh, come, come. That's why you're the dark horse <laughs> special forces of adventure photography. <laughs> you don't sing your praises high mm. enough. Oh, you don't understand how great you actually are. We all love you. Oh, thank you, Kenton. So, that was the fantastic Martin Hartley. What did you think of that? He still sat next to me, so I can pour even more accolade on him while he squirms uncomfortably in his chair. <laughs> um, but honestly, check out his work, www.martinhartley.com. There is only one Martin Hartley out there. His work is unbelievable. He, uh, I, I've got to get him on one of my expeditions. We didn't even touch the surface about the time that we, we both went climbing and on one rope we had Sir Ranulph Fiennes and on the other rope we had Greg Child, one of the foremost mountaineers of all time. So much I wanted to talk to Martin about, but let us know what you thought of it. Hit me up, hit the Barn Theatre up or hit Martin up himself on social media. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to answer any sort of technical questions about shooting in polar regions or what cameras he uses or f-stops or... I don't quite know what those guys get up to, but... <laughs> I think what it was, isn't it because my father was. I think it, I think because my father was a photographer, he was talking f stops and mm. ISO numbers, and it went above my. I've tried to learn. <laughs> I've tried to learn, but I just I just can't do it. I just go for the. Um, it's great having somebody in the. Do, 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 it's great having somebody in the barn and uh, not on Zoom. So normally, yes, yeah. no, normally the person would have gone by now. Oh my God! So the, I'm talking to the camera as if you're not here, but you are actually <laughs> here still. I don't quite know how to finish this. This is new shall ground I, for us. I just go. No, I think all we can say is, Martin, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, I know you live relatively locally, 
um, but you still made the effort to come in. So honestly, you are one of the most humble people that I do know. Uh, and I say, I'm struggling with how we, how we end this. So I just want to say to everybody, all the viewers or listeners on the podcast, thank you for your continued support. We hope to see you again next week. We're going to continue in the vein of Polo Explorers. Next week, we have somebody that Martin knows very well. Uh, he's got numerous accolades to his name in terms of uh, solo, uh, North Pole, South Pole. He's got the, uh, I think, the longest uninterrupted, unsupported, they're going to get the accolades wrong a little bit, um, unsupported Antarctic crossing or... The guy is phenomenal. I'm not going to give his name away now. I want you guys to, to hit us up, tell us who you think it might be. And the final thing to remember is what we do this for. We do it for you at home for some entertainment. This is all free, but ultimately it's to try to keep the barn theatre open. Save our barn. If you have the inclination, please do Go down the back of the sofa, pull out 50p, £1, £5, 10p, whatever it is, go to the Barn Theatre website and hit the donate button. Every single penny will help keep this amazing community-based theatre open. I'm Kenton Cool. that's Martin Hartley, and this was Cool Conversations. Same time, same place, next week. <laughs>